Now, for the sake of this video, I want you to imagine that you, yourself, are a tree seed. Doesn't matter what kind of seed, doesn't matter whether you're a nut, doesn't matter whether you're just a tiny little cottonwood seed, but imagine you're a seed. Now, in order to grow up to be a really large tree, you're going to need a couple of things to get by in the world. Now, one of those things you're going to need to grow is going to be sunshine. Another thing, of course, is going to be water. And then you're going to need soil to grow upon. And inside that soil, you are going to find plant nutrients that you need to get larger. Now, one of the key nutrients that plants need to grow is the nutrient nitrogen. It's an element. And unfortunately, even though nitrogen actually makes up the majority of the atmosphere here on planet Earth, most plants can't use that nitrogen. They have to get it out of the soil where it's limited. But fortunately, there's one tree here in the Pacific Northwest that really can help all of the rest of the ecosystem get the nitrogen that it needs to survive. So today we're going to be talking about the red alder tree. The Latin name is Alnus rubra. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit before we jump into how this tree fits into the ecosystem about how do you identify this tree if you do come across it in the wild. Uh, so first of all, alder trees like to grow on disturbed sites, so you'll often find them along riverbeds, streams, areas that recently had landslides, or even areas that were cleared out by humans, such as logging sites. Identification features. Uh, when you come up to the tree, you're going to probably notice the bark of it first. The bark of the red alder is kind of smooth. Um, it's usually kind of a whitish gray color, uh, and that's usually going to be because it's speckled with lichen spots, but a very light colored tree that you're going to find. Oftentimes, especially on older trees, you're not going to find that many branches down near the bottom of the trunk, but you might find small twigs coming out and kind of a sucker growth is what we'd call it in big bunches, but no large branches down near the ground on an older tree. Now, if you get your hands on some leaves and you want to look more closely at that, um, I've got a little diagram back here of what to look for. Uh, you're going to be looking for doubly serrated edges. That means that the edge of the leaf is not only going to have these big teeth right here, it's also going to have smaller teeth that you'll barely be able to see going along the edge as well. It's going to have pinnate venation. This means that there's going to be one central vein and small veins coming off on either side of it. I don't like to identify trees by telling you what color the leaves are because leaf color is kind of arbitrary, you know? You might say, oh, it's dark green, but that's something different. Uh, in this case, though, I would say that these are kind of a bright green, almost a light green color. Now, something a little bit strange with the red alder um, is how its reproductive bodies look. Um, so, what you will see in the fall um, is the emergence of catkins. Basically, that means um, that these little kind of green, dangly, long things are going to be coming off the end of the branches. Those are the male catkins. That's where the pollen comes from. Um, and those catkins are actually edible. Um, they're a really good source of protein. Uh, now that being said, they don't taste very good. So if you want to try one, you may. If you know for sure that it is a red alder tree, you never want to try something in the wild that you don't know what it is. Um, and then along come the female catkins later on. And you'll see those um, in the fall, uh, which is when I'm shooting this video right now. By this time of year, they're going to look almost like small pine cones hanging off the tree. Now, this is actually quite unusual uh, for a broadleaf tree, a tree that we might call deciduous, one that loses its leaves in the fall. Most often, trees like that don't have anything to do with cones. Um, so, these are actually a very solid identification feature. If you come across something like this, you know that it's going to be some type of alder tree. And one final thing, why would they call it the red alder tree? Uh, so the answer to that is actually the color of the inner bark. If you scrape off the outer kind of light gray bark of the tree, you'll find that inner bark um, and on the roots as well to be a very bright red color. Um, so generally you don't want to go damaging the tree to look at that, but if something else has already damaged the outer bark, you might get a chance to see that as well. So now let's head out into the woods and take a look at this tree growing in its native habitat and see how it fits in with the rest of the world and with us. I'm standing here today along the banks of the Skagit River with my friend, the red alder tree. Now, red alder trees are highly adapted to live in areas that have a lot of disturbance, places where a rock slide has gone through or a flood, maybe a forest fire. These are usually one of the first trees to come back after something like that happens. And when they come back, before all of the other trees, 
they actually help build up levels of soil nitrogen. But how do they do that? Now us tiny humans might sit down here at our lowly place on the ground and look up and assume that the main stuff going on with this tree is happening above the surface. That's actually not quite true. What is going on above us is all of the leaves in the canopy of this great tree are taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Carbon is kind of like the currency of plants. They're going to be trading that around because with it, they're building their structures, they're using it to create energy, but there's other different types of life inside of the forest that are also craving carbon. Now down here underneath the soil, there's a lot more going on in what we would call the rhizosphere, the area in which roots are growing. So underneath the ground, there's all kinds of different fungus and bacteria and invertebrates that all are an important part of the forest ecosystem. But in the case of the red alder tree, there's one particular type of bacteria that's more important than the rest. That would be Frankia. What happens is the red alder tree in its root systems actually creates specialized nodules or little homes for this bacteria that are on its own roots. It's the perfect habitat for the bacteria to move right on into. Now, what happens after this point is really special. It's what's called a mutualistically symbiotic relationship. Basically what that means is both the tree and the bacteria benefit from living together. So, how does that work exactly? Well, let's put it like this. These leaves up here in the tree are supplying the tree with carbon from the atmosphere. Um, and carbon is something that the bacteria Frankia also needs. Um, so what will happen is the tree will trade. It will give Frankia carbon. Now, in order to make it a trade, Frankia has to be able to give the red alder something in return. Fortunately, this bacteria has the ability to take nitrogen out of the atmosphere and turn it into something that the trees can use, an ability which these trees and most other trees do not have. So what happens is the bacteria will trade nitrogen in exchange for carbon. The red alder benefits because it gets nitrogen. That nitrogen also spreads out through the uh, rhizosphere, that area where the roots are growing, and allows other trees to get nitrogen from this arrangement as well. Ultimately, when this red alder tree dies, all of the nitrogen that is stored inside of its trunk will also get released back into the ecosystem, allowing for a buildup of soil nitrogen, which really is important for other trees to be able to thrive. So, uh, one thing that goes with that is because red alder is adapted to live in an area with high disturbance, it's not really made to compete with other trees. Trees, especially like our conifers, which go very fast and very tall, might shade out a tree like our red alder very quickly. Most red alder trees actually don't live much further than about 80 years of age. Um, at that point, either they just die of old age, or they might be outcompeted by other trees which are benefiting from their nitrogen arrangement. That's a little bit sad, but the good news is, is they are adapted to reproduce very quickly um, and come in, and without this tree, the rest of the ecosystem wouldn't be able to thrive nearly as well as it does because of that beautiful, mutualistic, symbiotic relationship with the nitrogen-fixing bacteria called Frankia. So nitrogen fixing, that's a pretty cool thing for this tree to help out on. Um, but there's other places that we need nitrogen in our soils other than the forests. Um, humans might benefit immensely from having this tree around our agricultural lands. We use a lot of nitrogen fertilizers these days, um, and having a natural solution like this to provide that nitrogen into the soil for free would be really beneficial for small farmers everywhere. Um, in addition to that, there's a myriad of other human uses that can, we can get from red alder. Since time immemorial, a lot of our indigenous peoples of western Washington have used the red alder tree for a variety of purposes. One of the main ones would have been as a, a cooking wood. Um, it produces very little smoke, which is of course very pleasant if you're having to sit next to a fire and cook by it. Um, in addition to that, they can obtain a, uh, a dye from the bark of this tree. Now that dye is kind of a reddish color um, and has been used by indigenous peoples, again, of western Washington to dye their fish nets, making them almost invisible to fish under the water, which of course helps you catch the fish. The wood is exceptionally good as a carving wood um, and has been used, uh, again, by indigenous people for thousands of years, but also is being used um, by furniture makers, um, people who do woodworking for tool handles and the like. Um, and in addition to that, 
Uh, because this tree grows well on disturbed sites, it's very handy uh, to come in and help with bank stabilization, preventing the loss of topsoil after a site has been disturbed, including places uh, that have been cleared for industrialization, building things up, as well as road banks um, and trails as well. So a whole lot of things we can get from the red alder tree. The next time you're outside, take a moment to look around and see if you can spot a red alder tree and remember how this tree connects you with the forest.